Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host, Raghunath. And our co-host, Kastuba, is not here today. He is frolicking, frolicking in the Ganga today. I'm here with Mara, who's spinning the dials, chopping things up. And we are also live on Facebook today. It is sleeping Saturday. It's 8 o'clock New York time. And usually Saturdays and Sundays, we do Q&A day and interview day. We switched it around this weekend. We have Q&A day today with special guests live from Puerto Rico. I've been waiting for this interview for about two years right now. Really excited. But before we get into the introductions of this wonderful couple, Mara, what's going on in your life and in the world of Wisdom of the Sages? Uh, well, we got some back to recovery group meetings today at 930 and 1230 Eastern time. And there's a shloka memorization group with Nityananda Chandra at 10 a.m. Eastern time. This community is beautiful. It's an incredibly I, things are I, things are sprouting up that I don't even know is happening. There's sloka groups. There's breakaway groups. There's maybe some anti Raghunath groups in there having meetings. Uh, they're not telling me about that, but I've heard rumors. But um, no, this we have sage groups and people are just getting together and they're creating friends. And that's how we change. We don't change. We, we, we tend to have a, a weakness and people don't like to admit this, but we're weak alone. But when you get around friends, when you get around community, you can become stronger. We're not just about having community because you could have a community. You can have a community of horrible people. We want community of people that want to uplift us, upgrade our lives, keep us strong when we are when we are weak and keep them strong when they are weak. And that's what community does. It's banding together a bunch of twigs and it's hard to break many twigs. Easy to break one little twig. I'm like a twig. Anyway, um, this is going to be a theme today. I also, before we get go anywhere, we want to mention Wisdom of the Sages, Italy retreat. This is a great way to have a spiritual vacation. It's not super expensive. Traveling ex Italy can be expensive just to get an Airbnb is expensive. But we have a whole uh, transformational experience. We do it in a beautiful ashram in the Tuscany Hills. And then we go to cool places. We have Wisdom of the Sages live. We have morning classes. We have yoga classes. It's quite wonderful. And we're going to have BRG meetings, Bhakti Recovery Group meetings. And it doesn't matter if you've never done uh, hard drugs or substance abuse. We all need to recover, so to speak, from the material world. This is material world recovery. And so we showcased uh, Jiva G, who came last year, to our uh, Italy retreat. And some people walked away from that retreat, Mara, saying that was one of the highlights of this entire retreat. Yeah. You know, forget dipping in Cinque Terre into the beautiful sea, hanging out with Jiva G and just sharing your heart. You know what happened? People would go to these uh, Bhakti recovery groups and they'd be like, well, I don't really need this. I just like to check it out. And it'll be, I'm going to be in the back to checking it out. And the next day they were like, I need this. I'm qualified for this meeting because we all have stuff we want to uncover because part of becoming authentic is to let go of our inauthenticities. And as described um, in Vedic teachings is we need to share our heart with other people, with ourself and with God. 
And um, I'm really happy the Bhakti Recovery Group is going hand in hand with Wisdom of the Sages in ways to sort of like, um, as the progression of Bhakti grows uh, to the Western culture, I think it's a, like an important contribution. So check that out also. That, okay, so I want to introduce Vaishnav and Draupadi from Puerto Rico. Um, they run a permaculture farm uh, called Plenitude. I've been pronouncing it wrong all these years. Plenitude Puerto Rico believes in the transformative power of service to make a real difference in the world. By coming together to serve each other and the planet we all share, they work to find solutions to our biggest challenges and help us live more sustainable, harmonious lives. While Plenitude Puerto Rico is centered in Puerto Rico, they aspire to be a model of global change as, as we all face the difficulties caused by the climate crisis and by social and economic inequality. Shropati Vaishnav, welcome to the show. Thank you, Raghunath. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's a, <clears throat> it's a credible opportunity for us to be here with you all. And um, yeah, we are big fans of Wisdom of the Sages, especially during uh, the height of the pandemic. It was a real lifeline. And we both just admire so much, and not just the two of us, but so many other people that collaborate here and work with Planetude PR. Um, yeah, just really appreciate the three of you, right? Raghunath, Kastuba, and Mara. And uh, you guys are like a special kind of chutney. You know, you got the spicy, the sweet, <laughs> neutral. Yeah, I, I am sort of sweet, aren't I? <laughs> Yeah, you're a sweet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, yeah, but um, I, I will say you guys are living my secret life right now. I, I, I very often want to I'm I'm envious. I'm jealous. I want to sit at your feet. I want to just study. Mara knows I'm a part time botanist and forager. She knows that that's part of my bio. I've I've desired to build natural buildings for like 25 years. And I just, I don't even know what I do. I don't know what I do on this planet, but I'm not good at many things. But I, I want to break away from my life just so I can just study this stuff. All I do is study it through books. And But I actually want to go there. Now, I'm looking, if you're watching this on Zoom or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see a round building. They're actually in a round building because there's another thing I studied is this super adobe. You're in a super adobe building right now. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And yeah, you're you're very humble to say that you don't do much, but we know that sharing your heart and uh, mind like you do with everybody is is incredible. And getting on this podcast every day, it's incredible. We have a lot of respect for what you do, too, and the way that you do it. It's it's incredible. And uh, yeah, and public speaking is challenging and you're so good at being vulnerable with people. It's incredible. I would be terrorized, you know, with cancel <laughs> culture and all kinds of stuff. I mean, getting on, you know, having thousands of people listening to you and you know sharing your mind and heart the way you do it's it's incredible we admire it yeah and so uh, but, uh, but yeah is this the is the super doby house this is the super doby house we built this with our own uh hands blood sweat and tears yeah it took a couple of years and um you know let me just jump in here a little because when you're building houses you're using dumpsters of waste um it, just in the process whether you're renovating a house or building a house and these dumpsters of waste, they go somewhere. They go, you know, where I'm going today, I'm going to the dump right now to, you know, after the show, my, one of my favorite things to do with my kids. But there are, we suffer from a waste problem in this country and um, a big part of our spiritual life. And I really think that people practicing Bhakti for 30 years still need to hear this stuff is our connection with the earth, our connection with plants, our connection with growing things. And we talk about, hey, uh, spreading the holy name and giving Bhakti to other people. Some people can't even get God, but I feel like the way you live is demonstrating a connection with God. It's an access point for a lot of people. They may not get God. They may not get a deity. They may not get the Ganges, they, but they can get planting, growing, nurturing plants, creating homes with the earth itself. It's like everything created by God you're using without waste and you're regenerating, you're putting back in and the, you cut down the banana trees and then you mulch with the banana, with the leaves from the banana trees with the, with the banana peels. <laughs> it's like so exciting. And there's seeds and bananas. No one even understands their seeds and bananas. 
You know what I mean? And it's just the system is so perfect. How can you not have faith in a higher power or designer? You want to share something about um, your what your what? I got right off the topic of <laughs> houses, but I'm going to go back there. Why, why don't you share a little bit about the concept of permaculture? Sure. Yeah. Well, and we'll come back. We should share more about these super doughy houses. That's a great topic. I, I do. I'm, I'm going to go there too. But, I'm going to uh, go right there. But yeah, we've got, um, you know, to share a little bit more first, maybe about our, our work and our organization, we have, um, we're operating out of a 15 acre educational farm here. We're based in the Western mountains of Puerto Rico. And our farms, like it's an educational farm. So we're showcasing, we're trialing and showcasing all these different techniques. And we offer workshops and all kinds of activities for local participants, as well as we engage a lot with uh, participants from the United States and the international community. And uh, we have three programs that are focused on sustainability skills. So we teach natural building, which you're, already, you're excited about that, obviously. Very and, excited. Um, ecological agriculture, so that ties with compost, polyculture, uh, perennial systems, et cetera and uh, water security. So we're mostly focused on uh, rainwater harvesting, emergency water filtration. So those are the programs that we have that are uh, focused on those three sustainable skills. And we also um, have two programs that serve the most vulnerable populations in our community, including children and youth and uh, elders. So it's a, you know, it's like a school and we're giving back to the community. And uh, there's also an aspect to our pro project that's like an intentional community of people that are living together here in our 15 acre farm. There's at any given moment, usually from 12 to 15 people living and serving here, together, contributing their skills and talents in different ways. And people with diverse backgrounds, people from Puerto Rico, the United States, people that are helping to build and other people in sales, other people doing communication and website, preparing educational materials, cooking, you know, so we're also, a, in a sense, a, um, an intentional community of people that are living and, and working together. And I think it's interesting, too, to highlight, too, especially since this is a podcast focused on bhakti yoga, that we also have um, a lot of people in our community and our project, about, there's about 30 of us in total that are collaborating on a daily basis, weekly basis. Mm. Um, we come from different, the different faiths and backgrounds, um, you know, drove Uh, but then you practice bhakti, and that's been our kind of core of our spiritual path. And there's a number of people in our farm and project that also um, really focused in on bhakti as their path. But there's other people in our group from different faiths, Christianity and Buddhism. And that's, um, yeah, that's something really beautiful about our project, but also really challenging is having. Um, people working together, right? Working together for a common purpose of serving the community and mm -hmm. uh, trying to figure out, right? It's like you said, it's kind of a lost skill, trying to figure out how to live in harmony with land. And it's been a, it's been a journey. It's been a journey and a discovery process. And we're very grateful to have had uh, so much incredible mentoring and guidance from, from people along the way and, and really just incredible people that come together for this project yeah it's unbelievable that the very um thing that every animal does in the wild we've lost touch with how to eat food what what mm -hmm. food no how many people know what food grows in their yard N no one knows that all they know is how to go to the store and if they ran out of gas they wouldn't even figure out how to get to the store i guess we're gonna have to walk to the store and buy some bananas or something. And where are those bananas coming from? They're coming from Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. It's like we are lost. And it's amazing thing is God is providing everything. Like there are probably the more we can build even a big garden here. But the probably the healthiest things that will grow are the things that are just growing wild that we're just calling weeds and picking out. Um, mm -hmm. And so your re-education of the basic facts of life. I'm no better than my dog, Gus. This dog can't hunt. <laughs> he can't even hunt. He can't. I remember one time there were some like uh, coyotes in the front lawn. And I was like, Gus, go get out there and get those coyotes. He just like looks at the coyotes, <laughs> walks around. I was like, come on, go, go get them. The coyotes were having a standoff. They were just waiting there. And Gus, he was not even like growling. He was just sort of uninterested. And he just sort of walked back inside and laid down. It's like we have become domesticated dogs waiting for our food 
to show up from our moms or from our spouse or from our, but we've lost touch with that. And then when you get to that, it's like, how do I build a house? Well, I go to Home Depot. That's, that's how I could build a house, go to Home Depot. Where is that wood coming from? We're like clueless to where that wood coming from. And oftentimes in the same way our food has been bastardized and our food has become uh, um, um, uh, pasteurized, homogenized, um, you know, they're uh, sterile. Our fruits have become sterile. Um, in the same way, we do this mono cropping. I don't know if I got the word right with with trees, too. And we've like over over uh, deforested the planet places like, you know, you go to Ireland, you think, well, Ireland, the green fields of Ireland. Yeah, the green fields of Ireland, the whole thing's been deforested. Yeah. And if you if you Google search like uh, 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 virgin oak trees of whatever, Pennsylvania or I mean, there, there were massive, massive forests here with massive trees that you can't it, we don't even know how big these maple trees get in these oak trees. They were huge and you can still find these photographs um, of them. So this th what you're doing is sort of like the ABCs of human existence, these primitive skills and. I'm impressed, my friends. I'm very, very impressed. You want to share? Yeah, what you're saying, is, well, what you're saying is absolutely true. Yeah, there's a, such a disconnect now, right, between us and the natural world, and it's um, and we're getting right the materials for our housing, for our food in a way that's very destructive, and it's not aligned with the laws of nature. And uh, there's some real consequences to that, right? There's some real consequences, mm -hmm. and because everything's interconnected and the planet. We're feeling that, right? The climate crisis. I remember 20 years ago studying, right, University of Florida and reading about climate change. And it was like, just felt more theoretical. But now it's like, everybody's really feeling it because everything's interconnected. And um, yeah, we're really going to be paying the price for this, uh, this way that we've set up this whole society that's completely out of alignment with uh, nature's laws. And that is one of the things that, yeah, we're trying to recover. You know, Plantude PR, we're focused on, solutions but it starts with understanding the nature of the problem and like you're describing and the waste that we produce and mm -hmm. the disconnect and and uh, the destruction so it does start with understanding that problem and then what we've attempted to do right in our very small uh very tiny little way here in puerto rico is uh provide an alternative right and showcase an alternative for what is a different way that you could live mm -hmm. and uh, and you know what we've learned too is the skills and the techniques they really are out there. There's a lot of information. There's been a lot of uh, prototypes and tests and models that have been so successful. They're showing that this works, um, but something's got to change. There's a lot of a lot of apathy, a lot of inertia, and we're hoping in our small way to to contribute to that. We've also um, got a lot of inspiration from the Govardhan Eco Village. I don't know if you want to share something about that. You like to share? Yeah, please. Yeah, um, Raghunath, I totally agree with what you're sharing. There's like a sense of urgency, right? Like this climate cli climate crisis is like right in front of us. And and as Vaishnava is saying, Radhanath Swami, um, we had the opportunity to meet him a few years ago, and and it's we've been drawing a lot of inspiration for his work and and his approach, right? Like as spiritualists, we can't be just like you know like oh practice our you know our our path and just be aloof to what's going on and mm -hmm. and we really appreciate how you know he always brings it back to the ecology of the heart you know like how we could clean the rivers we could do everything externally that we can but if we're not focusing and in, in right in the source which is our greed as humans then we can't you know be part of the solution and and once we focus internally on you know on our actions and our thoughts our our heart then we can actually be empowered to to serve mm -hmm. others and and any change it's valuable you know like like anything that we do um to to serve the planet and serve others is valuable it doesn't matter how how small it is there's actually if i can if i could quote radhanath swami um he says in one of his lectures that we love so much <laughs> He says, the very heart of true spirituality or dharma is to reconnect, reconnect with the love, the spiritual love for God that is within our hearts, and to express that love by living with compassion. A compassionate lifestyle is inseparable from our interaction with environment, because everyone is equally dependent on the gifts 
of nature. From a spiritual perspective, there is such a deep understanding of this idea. The entire creation, all the resources around us are sacred and all living beings are children of the same source. We're all truly brothers and sisters. When mm. we have this appreciation, we no longer consider either individually or collectively that we have the right to exploit, but rather we're ca caretakers of sacred property because all life and all its forms are sacred. Mm. The spiritual principle is really foundational to self-realization and spirituality. Wow, that's beautiful. I, um, and I think, yeah, there is a definitive uh, um, I'll give you an example. When I was living in the temple, when I first started living in the temple, and there there was such an urgency to preach. And like you got to give books to people, keep giving people books and books and books. And I, I get that. It's important to educate. But I felt like, well, here I am, like living in a city, telling people to to um read this book so they can become a monk. Back then, it was like there was no community. It was not such a real community. It was sort of like you're trying to like develop how many people can we get to live in a temple? It, it, it was like a very sort of like rajasic sort of like attempt to just get the word out. And I get it and had a purpose. But I, I kept on saying, get the word out to what to ultimately what to just sell more books. Is that it just to sell more books? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a lifestyle that goes along with this. And what's happening now in Bhakti in this next level of Bhakti is that we get to live this stuff. We get to apply this stuff to a lifestyle. And it's not just about you, you, you living the way you do speaks so loudly. That's the preaching. It's not even with your mouth. It's the way you're doing everything on a day-by-day -day basis. And that's impressive to me. And that's what I think we need to model. And what you're doing is you're creating a micro community that's seeing that. And the thing is, Prabhupada, our, our guru's guru, Bhaktivedanta Swami, he had this idea that the collapse of society, it's not, this isn't some crazy type of uh, uh, conspiracy theory. You can't drink the water out of a river. That is like a weird thing. It's not a normal thing. That is a very weird thing that you can't drink the water out of the river, right? <laughs> yeah. And so when we think like, well, of course you can, it's a city. Yeah, well, this is a, this is a new thing in the history of the world that you can't drink the water. And so when we talk about, uh, and Prabhupada said, you know, you got to create these farms. You've got to get back into simple living. You've got to get back into the, these small communities, uh, farming, take, working symbiotically with animals. And, um, and then what happens is, um, you know, uh, you know, the, I think the Harry Krishna movement sort of imploded on itself. And then from the ashes, now it's growing again because people realize the importance of spiritual life. Or what you have is like when 20 years ago, when I was starting to get into permaculture um, and, th and this type of thing, and I started studying it and going out with people. And these people are very forward thinking. These people are pushing permaculture and they have an incredible sharp mind and they're connected in a spiritual way. But I felt like they don't have this culture. And when you marry these two things, it makes all the sense in the world. Because I remember I was at one uh, permaculture weekend thing and we're getting around and we're doing a uh, bare root planting and we're doing composting and we're doing, it was a very beautiful setting. And at the end, it ended with a big bonfire where we're all sitting around and everybody was just drinking beer and just looking around a bonfire. I was like, we're missing something here. Now we're now this is where Bhakti steps in. It's not just so we're living in the woods like a bunch of beavers and woodchucks instead of these city slickers. We want to be spiritualists who are connected. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's true. And I think that you're getting at a really important point. And, and what um, Radnath Maharaj is making this point, too, that, yes, yeah, is people that practice Bhakti like we all and people that are serious on a spiritual path, that has to be manifested in a real practical way, right? That compassion. And I think it is easy for us to sometimes kind of hide behind, you know, a little bit of apathy there where we're, you know, we know that the ultimate goal is to transcend all this, right? We know that it's primarily a transformation of the heart, but I think it's easy for us to sometimes to kind of hide behind that and not 
really take practical steps and engage with the world that we're living in. And uh, I think that that's why this example that Maharaj is setting with the Govron Eco Village is is so important and so valuable. And of course, like you said, Prabhupada also with, you know, uh, New Vrindavan in Western Virginia and Gita Nagari. Um, these examples are really important. And it's, um, it, 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 like you said, there is something that's missing though. There's something that spiritual communities can offer that is often lacking in permaculture or, right? Because there does have to be ultimately a, an ultimate goal to life, right? Like Prabhupada often say, what are the real problems? The real problem is like, you have to die and you don't want to die. Like, what does that mean? Like, what does that all come to? You can have a really beautiful, harmonious farm and you're in touch with nature and you go to the creek and take a swim and you drink your water out of your Berkey and you got your fresh fruit <laughs> and all that stuff. And, and then you're still- We have a Berkey, sick. we have a Berkey. So do I, yeah, so do I. Yeah, I was kind of, yeah. yeah. So we've, uh, but we're still going to get old and we're still going to die. And so this, this need for philosophy and to really engage with these deeper questions, right? Mm. What is my real identity, right? I'm a, I'm a spirit soul. I'm inhabiting this body, but I'm a spirit soul, right? And this transformation of the heart. And that is something that, that Bhakti uh, uniquely provides, right? And other spiritual paths. Sure. And I think, I think the devotees have become like the, uh the slow kid running behind. And now people have been doing this. People have been building with cob and building with earth and building with hay bales. And people have been very serious about, um, you know, partner planting and growing, you know, uh, edible forests and stuff like that. They've been getting forward. And now we have to learn from these people who just got into it, but we we are offering the why behind it all. It's not just to live like a hermit. It's to sort of like live in an integrated way with nature so we can connect and get that access point to God. Another thing I think is really great that you're doing is, again, some people can't understand God, don't want to understand God, but they can understand planting tomatoes. Like that is what you guys are doing. And you're not living out there in a cave or in a bubble. You actually are really integrated with the community in Puerto Rico. Like people who are not necessarily spiritual per se you take groups or classrooms to your farm and you're you're endorsed by the government is that correct that's correct yeah we, we're um yeah our nonprofit organization we have a tax exempt status we get grants federal grants uh, local state grants we work with foundations our our organization isn't a spiritual organization a lot of the individuals in our project right have really are very rooted in a spiritual path and that's something that we carry uh, a little bit more privately and share with people and, you know, personal conversations and stuff. But our, our organization, our outward facing work really isn't religious or spiritual. And we have made, yeah, a big em emphasis on uh, engaging with local community members. And I think it's like you said, people really respect that when people respect you as a human being first, um, and they really can feel that they become curious and interested too. what is behind that? What is behind that? Like um, a program that we've been doing since we started about 10 years ago. It's called service learning. We receive uh, on average 10 to 12 groups of university students from the US at our farm. They come for one week. Um, you know, we've got rustic facilities. All we can offer them is camping and stuff, but they come and camp. They engage with us in community service. They help out the schools. They help out with the seniors. They learn how to grow food. We share meals together, right? And uh, it's so amazing to see how much they get transformed by this experience. Just uh, tomorrow, actually, we have a group of uh, 12 students coming from California from Loyola Marymount University and um, yeah and they come and they just experience the space and there's something that people are people are missing that contact with nature right having the direct contact with nature and also community mm -hmm. you know these these mm -hmm. phones and social media it, it's a way to stay connected but I think everybody can agree that it, there's too much emphasis on these scrolling and all that's you know there's nothing like sharing a meal with somebody and that's this program service learning that's what people do they they serve together they share meals together. They wake up early and do yoga. They hear nice, uplifting music. They're surrounded by good, positive people. And they really get transformed. It's amazing just one week to see the way that people get inspired, right? Right. Right. Yeah, totally. The unity, like coming together for that single purpose of doing service and just seeing mm -hmm. how that's in everyone's nature. And and that's something we've seen here, like with the working with the community, like and integrating the community, how everybody just loves to serve and it just gives them like a higher purpose in life and 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 it's just so transformative and one of our permaculture teachers Jeff Lawton 
um he's from australia he's, he's yeah. traveled he traveled the world you probably no, he's think. huge he did reforesting the desert yes right? yes the, and, youtube search these people they're incredible right what Jeff they've done Watkins. and yeah. swales there's a little bit of a squirrel but like have you seen the swales they do with these huge machinery like excavators and like unbelievable swales. Oh, swales right yeah we've got swales i'm a swales swale Roger. fan me too we got <laughs> swales you gotta come see our swales roger they're amazing all right i'm gonna yeah. And all right. something really interesting, you know, that he says after traveling like all over the world, giving consulting to like eco villages, you name it. And he's like, even despite climate change, you know, which is it totally throws you off when your work is to, you know, plan at a certain season. But now you can because there's rain or there's drought or et cetera. Mm. So it's really challenging these days, you know, to to farm and, and work with nature because of the imbalance. But despite all that, he says that. The most challenging thing in permaculture, and for those of you that don't know, permaculture is a science of design that also integrates um, ethics. ethics. Um, sure. so, so the basis of permaculture is to design in a way that we can meet our basic human needs, but still in harmony with nature, right? So, mm -hmm. so he's designing a whole piece of land, right, to meet all the needs of this eco-village, for example. So he's saying the most challenging thing is the humans, you know, like keeping humans together, working with humans. Yeah, we're and a disease, aren't we? We're like the uh, <laughs> white blood cells. What is it? That, the bacteria that gets in the healthy. The health, we're the parasite in the healthy host. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem sometimes like we're like a virus on this planet. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, it, it's something, you know, it, it's a challenge, but but just putting service in the center because everybody loves to serve. And we've seen how that creates that unity in the diversity of our backgrounds, of our spiritual paths, just like mm -hmm. keeping that service in the center. Right? Well, you know, I love to teach yoga and I live, I love to give classes on bhakti and tell stories from the Puranas and, and um, you know, that's what I, I love to do that. I love to travel. I love to go to India. I love to go on pilgrimage, but I love nothing more. When we have the, the Seva retreats at the farm and we're splitting wood and we're hauling stuff and we're digging holes and we're planting things, I don't want to do anything else. And they say, it's time to teach yoga. I was like, well, what about this? I got to do this. And it, it's just like the <laughs> most, and I will work myself to pure exhaustion and it's so joyful. And I think there's something on a very high level that you, what you guys were mentioning, it's like we're stuck on a phone and we feel disempowered. And I will say Mara, who's been a very good influence on my life, she has limited <laughs> my Instagram use. She went into my phone and nice. put, she because she catches me scrolling. Or she's like, what are you doing? I was like, Ugh. and I tend to watch things <laughs> like uh, everything from land i i follow hashtag uh landslides what else animal do i follow attacks. animal attack videos car car supercar fails that's a big one and uh what else <laughs> landslides uh anyway natural disasters uh, tornadoes i follow tornadoes uh, I, I follow police you know police encounters it's all stuff like that uh, you know the, the, the street fights the crazy stuff like this but she just chopped it. She just chopped it. She's like, okay, you want to do that? You get 30 minutes a day and you better make your own post to promote Krishna and what you're doing. And I was like, oh, I'm, wow, I can't do anything. It is such a gem to put a parameters on. I didn't even know how you could do it, but she figured out how to do it. It's like, it's like childhood, like a child uh, limitations. You give a child, you can't watch this. You can't do that. You got a time limit for oh, that. There's like a, like a setting or an app that there's does a, that? there's a setting. Tell, tell, wow. tell. Because you should be all doing it to your children Please. and then do it to your partner. Yeah, if you, go, if, I just Googled it, but it's really easy to change your settings to have limits on your apps and you can choose which apps you want to have limits on. So I just limited his Instagram for 30 minutes a day. Beautiful. I'm working. I'm slicing it down. I'm chopping it down. Anyway, and now I'm shadow banning them. They thought they were shadow banning me. I'm shadow banning them. <laughs> no, you're not going to take my time anymore, people. Anyway, um, I want to talk now, uh, food forest, companion planting, all that stuff is so beautiful. Um, water harvesting, love that word. Why do you have to harvest water? You guys live, in the, you get monsoons. You want to talk about water harvesting, the importance of harnessing energy? Absolutely, yeah. So the, the, you know, the slogan with water harvesting is uh, slow it, spread it, and sink it. 
right? So what happens is you get a big rain and it might rain a whole lot for a day or a few hours, but ultimately that tends to just go down the hillside, washes across, some of it soaks in, but a lot of it just goes right across the landscape. And then mm. you know, later on, you may have dry periods. And uh, But the goal is to recharge the aquifer, to have as much of it soak into the landscape as possible. And uh, there's different ways to do it. But yeah, that's kind of the slogan is slow it, spread it, and sink it. And so swales, terraces, some of these different techniques um, are designed to um, break, put the brakes on the water and spread it out. So they're usually ditches that are dug on contour. You can do smaller ones by hand. We've got a number of those where, you know, get a little work party together, some shovels and picks, and you mark out the contour and you dig a little ditch. And when it rains, it fills up with water, like a long, skinny pond or right. something. Right. And you can plant fruit trees on the downhill side of that. And they grow more quickly and more abundantly with that extra water. But you could also do them on, on big scale. That's actually one of my favorite things to do is like, get big heavy equipment like uh excavators diggers i love excavators yes <laughs> you know. it's my dream to get my own kubota excavator so do you do do you do uh water harvesting where you have like at the govardhan eco village they have massive ponds that they're harvesting water and we but if you miss that harvesting water like in india there's monsoon and it just rains but like um vaishnav is saying that Otherwise, it just goes to these, you know, and you see them like these uh, seasonal creeks, you know, or seasonal waterfalls. And it just goes away and it leaves you in a desert. So you're you're digging on either underground wells or massive ponds to hold that energy. And then you choose to distribute it. Hmm? That's right. Yeah, there's different techniques. You can also put it into tanks. That's one of the techniques that we do. Um, and after hurricanes in Puerto Rico, that's made a big, uh, big difference. Like, for example, five years ago. Uh, Puerto Rico was hit by, uh, I think it was Category 4 hurricane, Hurricane Maria, and mm. practically the entire population was left without water and power. But we had water, we had these big rain tanks and stuff set up, and a lot of community members that we had been working with, and vulnerable seniors, we've installed rainwater tanks for them, and you can get by for several weeks with rainwater harvesting tanks. So yeah, there's a number of techniques, tanks, ponds, uh, swales are more about like uh, fruit trees, uh, those are more for like developing orchards in a good way. Uh, you can extract water from re uh, rivers and creeks. And uh, yeah, it's important. It's really important. You, and then you, you, you can you drink the rainwater. It's it demineralized, right? It's it's like distilled water. You can, you can drink it. Yeah, you should still purify it. But we after Hurricane Maria, yeah, we were uh, drinking rainwater through a Berkey water filter for weeks. Yeah, we still do. We still do this that. isn't conspiracy stuff. This is how to stay alive with our very fragile infrastructure of this world that we live in. Everything's fragile. And we just finally realized that during the last pandemic. I mean, I remember that, and we probably all remember that day right before the lockdown. I was mm -hmm. it like, wow, I think things are shutting down. I think things are shutting down. And I remember going to Albany. I was like, you know what? I should get some rice, you know? <laughs> and I went into Trader Joe's and the shelves were empty. And I was like, and then... I started to panic and I realized I'm so unprepared. Here I am living on the farm. It's completely unprepared. And the shelves were empty and people were scrambling and people were scrambling. Cause when people don't have the basic necessities of life, they lose their mind. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, this is a very normal thing. It's not a weird thing. It's not for fringe people of society to do. This is normal. We are living abnormal lives. My dog is living an abnormal <laughs> life. <laughs> he couldn't hunt a cat that's sitting in front of his nose. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want to I want to talk quickly about uh, the this building because I've been a fan of building with Earth, and there was a special design. And and you know you know in ancient time for all over the globe they built with cob, which is earth. And uh, I think dung and straw, is that correct? That's what cob is? It's mostly uh, clay rich soil. So clay sand and it's mixed with straw. And it's done right. manually and you kind of pack it on the walls and poke it in and stuff. Yep. And um, you don't build with cob there. You build with super adobe. Is that correct? Yeah, we focused on super adobe. So back in 2008, when we were starting the project, uh, which by the way, was a whole uphill uh, battle, just we did want to mention this at some point briefly, just to may serve as yeah, a little bit of inspiration for people. But when we started this project, we had 
no money. We didn't even actually know what we were doing. We didn't really know almost anything about a nonprofit organization, how to do it, no land, practically no skills. We just knew that it was important, right? And we mm-hmm. we wanted to do it. And we had a spiritual background. So we had that foundation. Mentor. Yeah, a lot of incredible mentoring. But um, anyways, we just, at some point, we did want to share that on the show today, because I know a lot of people may think like where to get started, but mm-hmm. there, it really is powerful. There, you know, they say, they say there's nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Mm-hmm. And uh, these are time. powerful. It's time. It's time. It's time. And it's these time. are these are powerful ideas that we're that we're threading on that we're standing on. There's a sense of urgency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And so sure. I was getting into. I was interested in Super Adobe when I was living in California, and that's right where the whole thing started. Is that correct? It's, yeah. So when we were when we were getting the project started, we realized like, okay, well, we don't really know what we're doing. We need to learn some skills. And one thing is we realized we need to learn how to how to build. And so um, I was kind of tasked with the assignment of checking out different techniques. I took some courses in New Mexico, uh, explored different techniques. But the question was like, what's one of the best techniques for the humid tropics here in Puerto Rico? Mm. And um, we ended up deciding that Super Adobe seemed like it was the best because it's the most versatile technique and also um, Cal Earth, which is based in Southern California, they've done a lot of work with permitting, uh, working with professional architects and engineers to get licenses and permitting. And and uh, so, yeah, we took courses out there in California and we taught a number of workshops here, brought in different specialists and um, to get their support. And uh, yeah, since 2010, we've been teaching workshops in this and built up almost all of the structures here at our farm are built from Superdobe and they've all um, held up really well against uh hurricanes also earthquakes they do well with flooding they resist fires they're like incredible they're indestructible climate, right? crisis. <laughs> climate crisis ready yeah, yeah. now how, how did you do in hurricane maria it was a breeze <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> strong breeze <laughs> it was a strong breeze but you just hunker down well yeah. uh it, it, the super adobe is these very long tubes um, like sandbags, but very, very long. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm just talking um, from what I remember. Long sandbags that you would wrap spiraling, spiraling like, um, you know, I used to do this when I used to do pottery in my pottery portion of life. But yeah, you uh, coil it around and you're making sort of like a domish structure. And then, um, so that becomes the like sort of the, the skeleton. And then you cover it with... Um, Earth, earth right. I understand, or plaster, clay plaster. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, you got it. it it's um, and it's something you can build in in community. But yeah, the main ingredient is dirt, and you can use often the dirt that's right there on your land. Um, in some cases, like here, our our soil has a really high clay content, so we actually get uh, dirt from a local quarry. And we're using like rejected excess material that's been contaminated. It's been a little bit mixed with clay. It's got some larger rocks some small rocks. So it doesn't really work well for, for the cement. It's like a waste. And we get it really cheap. I think like in this house here, we spent um, maybe like just over a thousand dollars on, on the dirt, like the primary ingredient. And yeah, you put them in these bags and it's just one <laughs> bucket at a time. One bucket at a time is a lot of manual labor, but you know, if you get some music going on, you get some good food going and a, and a team of people, all kinds of people can help. You know, we had men, women, teenagers, and you're children. Just going one, children yeah. And you're just going one bucket at a time and you fill it in the bag and you place it and you compact it and uh, lay barbed wire in between. That gives it the tensile strength that helps it to resist Ooh, earthquakes. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's, that's kind of a key element that helps it uh, perform better in earthquakes than some other techniques like do you dig it. Do you dig it under a little bit? So you're a little below ground. You can, you can burn it underground, but in the humid tropics, that's not as recommended because of all okay. the extra moisture, but okay. uh, we excavate uh, below the, where the walls are, we excavate footers and we put rocks in there. So that's called a rubble trench foundation. And then you start putting the bags on top of that and you can do all different kinds of shapes, uh, domes, uh, cylinders, vaults right now, actually we're, um, we've got a big project. We're uh, anticipating starting the next few months, but it's going to be the first large uh permitted structure in puerto rico with super Dobby. and it's uh it's gonna be a five apartment five apartment uh housing unit you should come when we start building it raguna yes yes i'll bring a group of people there we'll help build this i always wanted to do this let's do it let's, let's do, do it. it all right we're 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 in um i want to work more with you guys i want you guys to be part a more intimate part of my family well is that okay with you 
Of course. Please. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think that Wisdom of the Sages has to really get behind you and see where we can come. P maybe people could come and take a take a little breather and spend some time with you guys and learn from you. And like you said, just being around community, it's like we miss that. We've isolated ourselves from a community. And the best we got is a, an online community, but about living with people and people people coming over and breaking bread together and cooking together is so, what we're trying to do here too. It's super soul, but you guys are really set. You know, you guys are really raising the bar, and we really appreciate that. Can I ask you? I, I always had a question about this. When you're building those domes, does the dome go all the way up to seal it, or do you need to put a roof on top of that? Uh, you don't need a roof. No, you can take. Uh, you can close it. But often what we do is we leave an opening and we put a skylight in at the top to oh, let an extra, an extra light. Nice. nice but yeah, nice. something you probably know this, but with the domes, you don't actually need any kind of uh, support formwork below it. You don't need to have any kind of um, support system like you do when you're pouring a concrete roof, for example. What you do is you just keep stepping in uh, the bags very gradually. So you keep slowly reducing the diameter and each bag just leans over just a little bit. And it leans over a little bit more and you keep going up and then you can close wow. it. Like and your whole house is like sacred geometry here, basically. Yeah, yeah. you're using a compass the whole time, measuring. Um, okay, so yeah, good. People need to know that. It's not just some like, uh, you know, children building a mud castle. It is like, this is actually <laughs> some real engineer go engineering going on. And if you've been in one of these, they're cool in the summer, they're yeah. warmer in the winter, and there's, you know, there, you know what the amazing thing I find about these earth homes is there's a quietness in the house, a quietness, like you're in a cave. If you've never been in a cave, it's like a peaceful quiet. Do you experience that? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the clay plasters are beautiful. People love earth and clay plasters. They feel just very soft and yeah, very nice. And definitely now, the temperature too. It's really like welcoming you know how it just keeps it cooler in the summer right. and it's yeah especially in the tropics it's it's a now, in the, now in the tropics you don't have to worry about heating do you do you heat them no we don't have to do heating here yeah just wow you know. all right so you got that covered um but you could people do people do Absolutely. these in yeah. all over the northeast i heard there was a cob building in new york city truthfully wow. ever heard that Maybe. I haven't heard that, but I believe it. Yeah, they're all over the world. And um, yeah, for heating, there's these really cool systems where you can use firewood and actually mix it with cob benches and stuff. You can actually yes. actually meander the um, the chimney can kind of go horizontal under a cob bed or bench and stuff and kind of meander through your building and work its way out. And, and you can take more advantage of the radiant heat. Yeah, there's some cool designs. There's a lot of amazing techniques out there. They really are. Yeah. And, and, and the flooring, what kind of flooring do you have? Flooring, we've done earthen floors, and uh, we also do the more conventional cement floor with tiles. We've done both. Mm. Yeah. You know, I was with uh, Radna Swami, Mara was too, right? And, and uh, they built, the, he's, you know, carefully built these outdoor temples to, to to remind us of being in Vrindavan and Braj, like Barshana, there's a Barshana temple, and then he has this beautiful cob floor. But some of his people, because this is what we do in the West is we like, like say, yeah, well, people don't want to sit on the floor. We're going to lay down drop cloths. It's like, it's like people want a shiny apple. They don't want an apple with a dent in it or a mark in it because it's not shiny. So we've been programmed to like the unnatural and it's been pushed on us. So he walked up to this temple and he saw all these ugly plastic drop cloths on the ground. And he said, well, why are these here? He goes, oh, for so people could sit in and not, not get dirty. And he said, do you know how hard I worked on mm. making this? So it's just you're standing on the earth, the cow dung and the earth floor. That is the cleanest it's going to be. It doesn't get cleaner and more you know, comfortable than sitting on the cow dung floors. And it's so true. When you wow. take away these ugly tarps and you're just sitting on that earth, it is so nice. It's so grounding. It's so pleasant. I'm looking at you guys completely envious, looking at that beautiful rounded room you're in with the clay walls. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. And being in touch with nature and having that access, you know, every day to, to nature, it is beautiful. We, we do feel very fortunate and happy. You know, we don't have a big retirement fund. Uh, we don't really 401k. I don't even know how to start one. We don't have that, but we've got wealth of 
uh, nature and relationships. You know, there's amazing relationships here. We're surrounded by loving, amazing people that are serving with their minds and hearts and, and fresh food and, you know, it's mm. fresh air and water. We feel very, very wealthy in that way. We do feel very fortunate. Yeah. And you're missing out on nothing. Obviously, you have electricity there. You're plugging in the computer. Obviously, you know, you have. it's not like, yeah, and we're doing without. No, you're living in abundance there. Where do you swim? Where do you swim? It gets hot. It's in Puerto Rico. You're not by the ocean. We have a little river in the property where we go and cool down. <laughs> nice. A river. Everybody needs a little river. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, I want to apologize because I think I did more of the talking during this interview than you guys did. But you just excite me and you've excited me and I've been... <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I want to come down and figure out how to do something together because I want to contribute. Um, I feel like I'm, I, I do a lot of taking. I want to give. And you're, you people, I really appreciate what you're doing. What's the best way people can thank reach you, so you? Yeah, thank you so much for your enthusiasm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's different ways people would reach us. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that this summer, well, we do have limited capacity, right? Right now we're, we're growing. But just the last few years, our organization's gone through a big growth spurt. And we're still trying to kind of you know, grow into it's kind of like an awkward, you know, when you get those awkward teenagers and all of a sudden they kind of like grow up like a foot. weird, like their feet are very big, but they're still yeah. short. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of like that, you know, it's kind of like that. We're like, yeah. all you're in stuff. puberty right now. <laughs> yeah, plane two is kind of in that puberty phase. So please have patience, just a little disclaimer. Um, and we, as I mentioned, we do have a few big infrastructure projects on the horizon and what we hope to get to, right? It's probably gonna take three to five years is we want to have enough facilities and infrastructure here where we can work with people like you and Gorvani. He's come here a number of times and John v and, you know, all the amazing people like you guys do. And, Let's um, do a retreat. Like, uh, do retreats and stuff, but yeah, it's going to take us time right now. We just have rustic camping and, uh, and a lot of, you know, people like it's kind of like puberty walk around trying to figure out how to grow into this space. <laughs> <laughs> This summer, though, this summer, we're actually um, going to be taking on a few new interns. So if there's anybody that wants to learn more uh, about agriculture, life. super dope, life. agriculture, especially people that are like really thinking about taking this as a, as a career path or that might want to um, work with us if they have the opp opportunity to like work with us for a year or something, we're going to be accepting applications for that. Oh um, my God. Yeah. I'm so impressed by you guys. Oh. Maybe, we're, maybe we're supposed to be in Puerto Rico. Maybe, maybe that's Puerto. maybe that's it. Anyway, and thank you guys. So it's yeah, every well, if I could, dot org. Let's get this. Plenitude PR.org. Yes, plenitude PR.org. Check us out. We're also on um, Instagram and Facebook. Plenitude PR. That's spelled P L E N I T U D. That means wholeness or abundance in, in Spanish. So check us out there. Uh, we got a summer internship every month. We do a tour also. And uh, we also have a lot of educational material like on our YouTube channel and Instagram. So please check us out and stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dropity. And thank you, Vaishnav. You really impress us. You really inspire us. Thank you so much. And I want to thank this entire community for making my, enhancing my life. My life's better with all of you. Hi. <laughs> and um, if you like what we're doing, everybody, you know what to do. You go to Apple Pod Podcasts, you can write, write us a little review. If you're listening to it on YouTube, make sure you comment, hit the subscribe and the uh, bell icon to get alerts about it. If you want to join us on Zoom, hey, you email Mara, wisdom of the stages 108 at gmail.com, and she gives you the secret code so you can enter every morning. You can see each other and you can write each other's secret notes. I'm looking at all these faces. You guys are my, fa you're more connected to me than my family than my family. This is what's going on here. Because is back. What are we doing tomorrow? Tomorrow's Sunday. Because back for Q&A day tomorrow. All right, so we're going to welcome him back. And then, uh, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks to the Zoomers. I see Lady Dies here. I haven't seen her. Hi, Lady Die. And who else joined late? I get to say hi to. Let's see. Anyway, it's time to clap. And give love to all the people at Plenitude. Tell them we love them. Bye. <laughs>